Hello and welcome to my channel, ladies and gentlemen. I have got probably a very big, well-known commentator, and it is Derek Ray. Thank you ever so much for coming on and uh, chatting to me, Derek. Darren, thank you very much for having me. I very much appreciate the invitation, and I see all the Hibs memorabilia in the background, so I know you're a big Hibs fan. Maybe that'll come up in our conversation, but delighted to be with you. Thank you. So, my first question, what inspired you to be a commentator as a young kid? I don't really know, is the honest answer. All I know is that I always wanted to do it, and from a very early age, from the age of about seven in Aberdeen, where I'm from, I used to take my little portable tape recorder. We, we had these fledgling cassette recorders back in the 1970s. And I would carry it around with me uh, to school, to the park, wherever there was a game going on. And I would just talk into it. And so I obviously realized early on I wanted to have something to do with commentary. I played the game as well, but, you know, just on a very average basis, I was not anything to write home about as a footballer. But I think maybe I realized fairly early on that if I did want to have any involvement with the, the game that I loved, then it was probably not going to be from a playing angle, but more um, as a, a journalist or a broadcaster. So I've been doing it since then. I got my big break at 19 professionally, which is very unusual. And I've been doing it ever since professionally. I mean, it must have been a shock when you got the big break when you were 19. I mean, you must have still been at school at that age. I was at university, Darren. I was at Aberdeen University. I had just, well, I was about to finish my first year there. And I'd been working for hospital radio for quite some time. Hospital radio, as you know, uh, is a service that is made available to patients in hospitals. So I did that in Aberdeen for quite some time. And it was through my work there, sending tapes of my work, that I got my big break. But my, my big break was actually because my hero, David Francie, who was the voice of Scottish football on Radio Scotland back then, he had an injury, so he couldn't do the game he was meant to do. And David had helped me get into the BBC, or at least he had um, sent my tapes on to his bosses there. So it worked out that my hero was unavailable. I got the gig, which was Kilmarnock against Dumbarton. It was my first ever live commentary match for the BBC. And then um, a few days later, was England against Scotland at Wembley. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was actually a bit of an audition for England against Scotland at Wembley. This was back in 1986. And that was my second game on the air with the BBC, which was quite a big responsibility at 19. I mean, um, who were your football and idols? That's a really good question uh, because I had quite a few footballing idols. And obviously being from Aberdeen, you know, my idols were people like Bobby Clark and Drew Jarvie, who were Aberdeen players at the time. Um, I will tell you, though, that, and again, coming back to your Hibs collection there on the wall, um, I had a little bit of a thing for certain players in Scotland. I did actually really like that Hibs team of the early 70s. And part of it was because they were quite good. You know, I didn't like Celtic and Rangers because they were the big teams, the big established teams from Glasgow and you know, there's a sort of a natural kind of antipathy. If you're from Aberdeen, you don't like the, the, the clubs who are really successful. And Hibs at that time were probably the, the most successful of all the, the non-Glasgow teams. So, I mean, there were people in that um, Hibs team like Pat Stanton, who I, I really liked when I watched him. Um, the late Eric Shadler was another one, you know, who was a great player. And I, I really enjoyed watching him. And, you know, people of that era at, at Hibernian as well. Um, on a world level, my great hero was Johan Cruyff, who was, for me, just everything that uh, embodied the, the classy footballer, the way he, he did things. And, and also the great goal scorer from West Germany at that time, Gerd Müller, uh, an absolute legend. So they were probably the, between, you know, that bunch would be people who I saw as heroes. There were many more. But I think we're all products of uh, when we grew up. And in my case, you know, I was born in the, the late 60s and my early football memories were all from the, the early 70s. So from a very young age, was commentating always in the pipeline for you? Um, 
I don't know if it was in the pipeline. I certainly, you know, wanted to do it. But I think it's like anything else, Darren, you know, um, you view a job like that as a dream job, but not one that you're probably ever going to get the chance to do, you know. So I, I did it and I did it with passion. And all my friends knew that I did it with passion. And, you know, they sort of joked that, oh, yeah, you know, you, uh, you're going to be famous on TV someday. That wasn't really the goal. The goal was really just to commentate. And I didn't know at what level that could ever be. You know, I thought it might be at local level in Aberdeen. Um, and you just don't know. But what I didn't realize was I'd actually been building up a lot of um, work examples over many years without realizing that, that what I was getting was my own work experience. And I will say this to people who want to get into broadcasting and ask me, how do you do it? And I will say, you've really got to be a bit of a self-starter. You've got to just go out there and, and do it, you know, even if it's just for an audience of one yourself, you know. That's how you, you get involved in, in commentary. That's how you get better at it. And then with that body of experience, someday, um, somewhere, somebody might give you a job. Um, what were you like as a kid? <laughs> These are really good questions because they're questions that I don't usually get asked and it's forcing me to kind of think a little bit. Um, as a kid, I think I was, I was probably not the most popular kid around because, uh, you know, I was maybe a little bit more eccentric than a lot of other um, kids. I, I, I liked what I liked and that were, was certainly football. Uh, it was certainly, you know, talking to myself in a tape recorder. Um, it was, I liked cricket as well. I was actually a, a better cricketer than I was a footballer. I used to spend a lot of time playing cricket in the summer and watching a lot of cricket back then. Not so much nowadays. But um, what else would I say? I was very much into German language at a young age and you know, listening to, to German radio. Um, I think I was a friendly kid, you know, I think I, and I had a lot of friends, but I certainly was never, you would never have said I was in the sort of the popular crowd or anything like that. I was just a normal kid from Aberdeen and, and I had my interests and I had my friends and, um, that probably sums it up. What was it like growing up in Aberdeen in those times? It was interesting because Aberdeen at that time was going through a, a big change. So, you know, I was born, as I said, in the late 60s. <clears throat> and then um, it was around that, well, the early 70s, it was around that time that the oil industry really began to change Aberdeen. So it sort of went from um, a fairly, you know, local industry in terms of things like fishing and, um, you know, some people would say granite, the granite industry going, going way, way back to then becoming this kind of big um, international hub for oil. And that brought a lot of people into Aberdeen. It had also changed people in Aberdeen themselves because a huge percentage of, of Aberdonians began to work in the oil industry or oil related services. And it did take on a different complexion, I think, Aberdeen. I, I think it, it changed the personality of the, of the place a little bit. But um, it's still a place that I think of as, as home in terms of where I'm from. Um, I haven't lived there since I was 19. You know, so that's going back to 1986. So it might be a bit strange for people to think that that's still home, but my family still live there, my parents, uh, my sister, and a lot of old friends. So, uh, you know, it's got its own culture. It's a bit different from the rest of Scotland in many respects, even when you think about the way people people speak the Doric in Aberdeen. It's a wee, wee bit different, Ken. Aberdeen speaks a bit like that. And, um, you know, I, obviously I can speak like that too because my parents spoke like that growing up and we would mimic them and learn a lot of Doric words. So, uh, so yeah, always, always going to have really good memories of Aberdeen and growing up in that period. What was it like working... What was it like working at the FIFA World Cup back in 1994? Oh, that, that's a, another really good one. Um, well, 1994, I should probably explain. I was not broadcasting at that World Cup. Instead, I had landed a job as one of the organizers, as uh, the press officer in the Boston venue, but also for the organizing yeah. committee itself, which meant that I got to travel to other venues and work at those venues as well. Um, it was amazing. It really was. It, it got me um, inside the game in a way that you can't as a broadcaster and a journalist. Because if you think about it, when you're the, the, the press officer, the media officer, 
um, for a venue, you're responsible for every aspect of the media in that venue, and that includes media facilities. You know, I didn't know at all um, the first thing about building media facilities for international media at the biggest sporting event uh, in the world, but that's what I had to, um, to get to grips with, something new for me. Um, you know, the, the media side of it, I, I understood because I'd been part of the media for several years and part of the international media. Um, but it, it was just, if you think about it, you know, at that time, the USA was not really a huge football country. People say it's not now, but it, it's come an awful long way since then. And part of that has been because of the 1994 World Cup. But uh, I really felt as though I was sort of on the inside and um, learning things, even though I couldn't talk about them publicly at the time, learning things that you, you really can't learn as a journalist. For example, um, even though it wasn't directly my area, uh, we would often get managers from these national teams coming into our venue and wanting to have a look around, wanting to look at potential training sites. And of course, they didn't really know where to start in a country like the USA. So my hand would always go up when my boss would say, oh, we need somebody to drive uh, the Dutch manager, Dick Advocat, around today. Who wants to do it? You know, my hand would always go up because I thought, great, get to, to drive um, somebody like Mr. Advocat around and, and chat to him, you know. And I found as I was chatting to him and Alfio Basile, the Argentinian uh, coach of the time, that, um, you know, you, you pick things up. And I think they were probably surprised to find a, a Scot next to them. They're probably expecting it would be an American who didn't know very much about uh, the business of international football. So I was a bit of a sponge for, for knowledge on those trips and um, got to know a, a tremendous amount of people. And so it's one of the, the happiest chapters of my, my life, even, even though it wasn't di directly broadcasting. It was um, intimately involved uh, in the football side of things with the biggest sporting event on the planet. What was it like calling the 2010 FIFA World Cup? The 2010 World Cup, uh, a special one, because that was in South Africa. And uh, obviously, I'd never been to South Africa before. I'd read a lot about it, read a lot about Nelson Mandela in particular, a, a great hero of mine, inspiration. And so that one was, um, you know, again, a different dynamic. And I think a lot of it had to do with the culture and the getting to know South Africa. That was kind of the, the extra um, component in that World Cup. It wasn't just the football. It was the, the South African element of it. And uh, from a footballing standpoint, um, I'm not sure that World Cup stands out as the very best. There were some good games. It was winter in um, South Africa. Winter is relative because yeah, winter there is probably, uh, you know, even then a bit warmer than, than July in Scotland, you know. So uh, we're talking in relative terms. But um, it, it was fun. And, and I just remember going into these different cities, whether it was uh, Port Elizabeth, whether it was Durban, I uh, didn't make it to Cape Town, unfortunately, which everybody said was the nicest of all the cities. I didn't have that on my itinerary, unfortunately, but Johannesburg a, a few times. And just up and down the country, uh, Bloemfontein was another one. And um, yeah, just really good memories of, of a, a, a different kind of World Cup uh, in, a, in a very dramatic setting, you know, South Africa. And um, yeah, it was uh, a lot of fun. How special was the, uh, the Euros in 2016 in France? Really good tournament. Um, enjoyed that one. Uh, did that for ESPN. I should probably explain. Most of these tournaments I've broadcast um, have been for ESPN in the USA. Obviously, in Scotland, you, you don't get to see that coverage. But um, that was uh, obviously the first one I can remember that had... Um, multiple teams going through to the knockout stages, which made it a bit unpredictable. I, I recall Portugal ha having a, a really difficult time getting out of that group and, of course, ended up winning the thing. So um, that, that was a, a, a very competitive uh, Euro. You had some great stories being written as well by the likes of Iceland and Wales. You know, so there were underdog stories there as well. But... Um, you know, some people will quibble with the fact that, that Portugal were the best, but the statistics don't lie, and, and they won the tournament. And I think the Euros always give us these competitive events, maybe more so than the World Cup, because I think the overall standard from, say, you know, even one to 
to to 15 or 16 in Europe um, is it, not that different. I mean, obviously, there is a difference. But I think that you have, if you like, a longer tail of the World Cup. You, ha you have more mismatches in the World Cup than you do in the Euros. Now, obviously, you've commented on some SPFL games in your time. What's the, what's the one that most sticks out for you? Oh, you, you are going to absolutely uh, hate my answer on this one. I can, t I can tell. Don't be too angry with me on this one. I'll probably think what, um, what it might be. You can probably guess, yeah. And I, I'm saying this not because I'm you know, a supporter of any one team, but as a commentator, obviously, you go with the, the story. And the one that immediately comes to mind was the, the Edinburgh Derby, which is my favourite Scottish fixture. Even as an Aberdonian, um, uh, the Edinburgh Derby has always been, as a commentator, my, my, my favourite fixture. That comes down to maybe the fact that I've covered it more often than, say, the, the, the Celtic Rangers uh, Derby, the old firm. Um, but if you remember the, the scenario, um, Hibs were going to Tyne Castle and the assumption was they were probably going to relegate Hearts that day. And that's certainly something that I had in my mind. I'm sure every Hibs fan thought that was going to be the case. Hearts were down on their luck and down on their financial luck. And we knew that they were going to get relegated, but it was really a matter of when. And it would be the ultimate ignominy to be relegated by Hibernian at Tynecastle. But of course, it went the other way. And um, as a commentator, I just remember the words flowing that day. And it was obviously very annoying for Hibs fans to see that happen. And when I think back to the game, Hart scored early on. Um, Hibs didn't play brilliantly, but in the last few minutes, they were pushing much more. And you probably would have thought that a Hibs equaliser was maybe more likely than a second Hearts goal. But then Hearts broke away. Hibs had obviously committed a lot of players forward. Billy King scored the second goal. Gary Lott went crazy. And it was, you know, kind of that human emotion, you know, of the relief of the situation. I don't think Gary Lott was celebrating like a, a, a dervish because, um, you know, for any other reason than the fact that, you know, he could have gone down in history as the man who was relegated as the manager of Hearts, relegated by Hibs at Tynecastle of all places. And um, my words in commentary that day, when just after that goal went in, were uh, not on this patch of Edinburgh land, not in a derby, no relegation today. You know, which I, you know, I was trying to sort of find the right words in my mind for that situation because it wasn't salvation for Hearts. It was staving off the inevitable, but it was staving off the inevitable against, um, you know, your, your oldest rivals. And of course, Hibs were to go down later that season and I covered that game as well against uh, well, the two games against Hamilton but the one at Easter Road when it went wrong so I'm, I'm sorry because I didn't bring your team much luck that season I have to say I think he obviously went he obviously went we got really good yeah with hearts I, yeah I think that's probably hell in a way because mm. since then, we've won the Scottish Cup. Yeah, and, no, I, th I think it's yeah. true. I, I think for every club, and fans don't really want to think this way, but for every club, you do sometimes need to kind of go down, refresh organically, and then come back stronger. You know, and we've seen that with, seen that with Hearts as well, haven't we? You know, during... Okay, maybe not right now, but we, we, we saw that with them when they came back up. And Dundee United, you could argue as well. You know, so every so often, I think it is the life cycle that a team has to go down in order to rebuild and come back up more strong. What's your thoughts on uh, Scotland being in the Euros for the first time since 1997? 19, 19, 98. 98. 98. Was it 98? Yeah. yeah. Can you see the smile on my face? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm very happy about it. Uh, I'm not the only Scot who's very happy about it. Um, I think we've all grown tired of, of having to refer back to 1998. And certainly I covered um, France 98 and little did I think at that point that it would be 22 years before we saw Scotland at a major tournament. Again, and somebody of your age, you know, has never known Scotland being um, at a tournament. So I, I'm really thrilled for the younger generation because you're going to get the chance now to enjoy what we got. I mean, when I was growing up, um, 74 was the first World Cup I can remember. We were at every World Cup, 74, 78, 82, 86, 90, missed out 94, 98. 
that were there, um, the Euros, 92, 96. I mean, it, it was the norm for Scotland to be at these tournaments. You know, we, we thought it, it was a terrible thing if we ever missed out on a tournament. Um, whereas the opposite is now true. Just to get to one feels amazing. So I think it's a big lift for, for the whole country uh, in football terms, as well as just for the country generally. And um, the challenge will be now to, to give a good account of ourselves uh, in what will be a difficult group, no doubt about that. And we don't know what the dynamics of the Euros will be next year, whether uh, it will still be having games at Hamden, whether we'll have any fans at all inside. We just don't know right now. I think it's probably pointless speculating about that. Um, but Scotland are there. It will give people something to look forward to. And yeah, the short answer is I am delighted. <laughs> Most famous player you've met? Most famous player I've met? Um, who would be the most... I think probably the most famous player I've met would be the great Franz Beckenbauer. Uh, that would be the most famous player I've met. Now, again, to younger people, maybe that doesn't mean as much. To anybody of my generation, trust me, that means a lot. If you're sort of looking at the, um, you know, the, the top players, we would probably say Pele, Maradona... Uh, I've met Maradona too, so I suppose he would have to be up there as well. Uh, but the conversation wasn't as long with Maradona as it was with Beckenbauer. I was at a dinner uh, with uh, with Beckenbauer, first of all, and um, happened to be not at his table, but close to it. And we got talking, uh, referring to some mutual friends. And then I, I sat down with a great man for an hour and did an interview with him about 15 years ago. So, um, so yeah, Beckenbauer would have to be the one that uh, that would stand out there. Best game you've called? Best game, um, 2005, the Champions League final in Istanbul in Turkey. And I travelled there for ESPN and I watched um, Milan play Liverpool. And Milan at the time were the best club in Europe, I thought. I thought they you know, just oozed class. Liverpool back then were kind of not the Liverpool of now and they weren't the Liverpool of, of the 70s or the 80s either. They were a bit of a, a kind of an underdog Liverpool. Um, nobody really expected them to get to the final. And then they were 3-0 down after 40 or so minutes. <laughs> and they came back to draw 3-3. Three, three, um, three goals coming really at the start of the second half. And it was just sort of boom, boom, boom. And uh, it went to extra time. It went to penalties. And Liverpool prevailed on penalties. So the greatest comeback you're ever going to see, or certainly I've ever seen in a major European final, and I was fortunate enough to be at the microphone to broadcast that final. So uh, that one will stay with me uh, forever. And, and I doubt it will be topped in my lifetime in a major European final. Best goal you've seen? Best goal I've seen, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, as a Scot, I'm tempted to say Archie Gemmell's goal in the 78 World Cup against the Netherlands because that just is, uh, you know, for a Scottish person, that you can't beat that one, really. Um, best goal I've seen, I'm, I'm going to go and often mention this one. It was a goal scored by Ronaldinho, uh, who was one of my favourite players to commentate on when he played for Barcelona. And I used to cover the Spanish league at, uh, during this period. This would be going back, you know, 14 years or so, um, 14, 15 years. And Real Madrid were kind of, they just started their whole Galacticos thing and they were basically buying the best players in the world. They had Zidane, they had Beckham, they had already had Raul and people like that, Roberto Carlos. You know, it was a really star-studded team. But Barcelona had their own stars. And um, it was a game at the Bernabeu in Madrid and uh, Ronaldinho scored it. And it was, it's hard to put into words, but he scored it from from the left, cutting in, beating a few players, and then just firing it towards goal and racing off in celebration. And this was at the Bernabeu. And what I remember about it is that almost to a person, the entire stadium got up and applauded this goal by Ronaldinho against Real Madrid in you know, the rivalry, El Clasico. Um, when Real Madrid fans do that for the rival player, you know you're watching history and you're watching something really special. So, yeah, I, I always like to single out that Ronaldinho goal against Real Madrid. Worst tackle you've seen? Worst tackle I've seen. Um, the one that springs to mind was actually a tackle by a Scot, um, Graeme Souness. 
um, a tackle that he put in on a young Icelandic player called Siggy Jomsson, who was very promising. And um, it was a big Iceland-Scotland game. It put Siggy Jomsson out of action for a long time. And honestly, if you, if you were to put that challenge in nowadays, you would uh, you'd be suspended for about you know, probably seven or eight games. That's how bad it was. But at the time, I, as I recall, I think he may have got a yellow card for it, um, if even that, you know. And that's a reflection of the times back in, in 1985. We would see things like that. But if, if you – I wouldn't really advise anybody to go searching for it because it was a horrible tackle. It really was. And um, uh, yeah, that was part of Graeme Souness' game, no doubt about it. He, he could do that. He could get away with it much more back then. Players could. But, yeah, that's the one when you ask the question that, that comes to mind. What is it like being on the FIFA game? <laughs> well, being on the FIFA game is great fun, first of all. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's many days in a studio every year. Not all at once. We do it in little blocks here and there. And it was about 25 days in the studio for the, the last uh, edition of FIFA or the most recent one, FIFA 21. Um, I love the creative process. We work with a producer and a sound man, and we just try to, to make it as interesting as possible. Remember, it's a video game, so I'm not in the living room when somebody's playing it, even though there are people who contact me and suggest to me that maybe I am, but I'm not. Um, and it's a matter of the producers coming up with the, the, the techniques to, to make it all work. But it, it's great fun. I definitely hear about it much more on social media than probably anything nowadays. Uh, People tend to be, um, I find younger people on social media are critical about everything. And obviously the, the, the video games are, are their thing. And so it goes with the territory. And I, I you know, I, I accept that that is part of the, the territory when you're in the, the video game business as a commentator. But I love it. And uh, it's nice when every so often you get a comment from somebody saying, um, yeah, really appreciate the, the, the call you made up my goal. And I say, well, I, I wish I could take credit for being there, having done it at the time. I can't. Uh, but hopefully it was a reasonable uh, facsimile of, of who I am and, uh, and what I might say in, in a game organically. What challenges have you overcame? Oh, another really good question. Um, I think the first challenge I had to overcome was getting into the business so young because that was really unusual. And... If you think about it, I mean, it probably wouldn't happen nowadays. And, you know, goodness knows how on earth it happened for me, but it did. So I can't argue with that. I got a big break. I think I had to overcome the perception early on that I was this, you know, kid who was broadcasting professionally. And, you know, how seriously do you take a 19-year-old on the air? You know, I'm probably totally fair um, in retrospect, but, you know, I was living that at the time. So I've had to overcome that. I think I also have had to overcome in my life um, working in a new country in the USA. And I came to this country with no prospects. I came here at 24 uh, without a job, without a job offer. Uh, and I, I came here and, and hopefully uh, demonstrated to other people that I could be a good asset to whatever they were doing, whether that was with the World Cup Organizing Committee, whether that was with ESPN, you know, having a, um, a voice and accent that's different. You know, I, I don't, I'm not American. I'm not from the culture here. So I've had to, I think, a little bit um, prove myself on that front. Um, so I, I think we're proving ourselves every day in life, though. I, and I think it never really stops. And I think the good professionals in life uh, and, and the good people um, in all areas, you know, give their best every day. And it doesn't always have to be professionally. Uh, we get up every day and, and we do our best sometimes for other people to help other people as well. And, um, you know, that can be proving ourselves, too. Best joke you've heard. <laughs> now, you know what? it can be a rude one if you want. You know, you know what? I, I am hopeless at jokes. I really don't. I'm not great with jokes. So well, maybe no. you can, you, you want to tell me your, your best joke? I'm useless at jokes too. What's <laughs> We're like even. Most, like, I don't know. What's the funniest thing that you've? ever said on like commenting well um the, 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 this one i can definitely help you with there have been a couple of those ones um so 
there, there used to be this thing called Coleman Balls, uh, which was a uh, there was a magazine called Private Eye, which is still going. And before internet and everything, they used to have this thing where they would quote commentators when they misspoke. And it's funny, I still see this one popping up 34 years later. It was my first year in commentary. And there was a player, John Clark, who played for Dundee United. Um, and uh, Hibbs in his past as well, by the way. But played for Dundee United. And I remember saying this in commentary at the time. Uh, and he was, he was a player who, who was, you know, was a centre half who headed the ball a lot. And um, I said, it's headed away by John Clark. I said, and it's headed away by John Clark using his head. I remember I said it, I thought, did I misspeak there? Well, some, you know, sharp-eared person heard that, sent it into private eye, and that one gets quoted over and over and over again. So you often see Derek Ray, it's headed away by John Clark using his head. Yeah, if you think about it, if you're using your head, then if you're heading it, you're using your head, you know? Um, but the, the other one that, um, that I, I do remember is I was interviewing Hamish McAlpin, who was the, the goalkeeper of Dundee United back in the 70s and 80s. And it was towards the end of his career. And I said to Hamish, a very unfortunate turn of phrase, I said to him, I think it was the last question of the interview. And we we're talking about the future. And I said, so Hamish, I said, none of us has crystal balls, but what does the future hold for you? And he said, well, Derek, can I first of all say, it's probably a good thing that we didn't hear crystal balls. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so yeah, I heard I heard about that one from everybody in the office after I brought the tape back. Best football anthem you've heard? Oh, the best football anthem for me, and I'm a little bit biased on this one, but it actually does take in Scotland. The best football anthem, and I I, I would say to any Scottish football fan, have a listen to this. And actually, you can find it on my social media feed. Um, Kern or Cologne. Uh, the German team that I have a lot of sympathy uh, for, um, they, before every game, they have an anthem, which is actually called Mersturm zu dir, that's the Kirsch dialect. Uh, it's basically about standing behind the club, Kurt. But it always takes Scottish fans by surprise when they find themselves there for a game, because the tune is the same tune as Loch Lomond. So if you can imagine the tune to Loch Lomond, which was a big hit in the 80s in Germany because of Runring, Scottish band who brought it to Germany and a sort of a rock version of Loch Lomond. And it's the one that you hear at Hamden and everything, uh, the Runring version. But a, a German band called Die Hörner made their own version of this using Kirsch words, but using the same tune to Loch Lomond. So the last thing you hear, just as the, the players are about to come out of the tunnel, is you hear the and, you know Scottish fans immediately go, hang on, they're playing Loch Lomond here, you know, but they're actually playing this um, Kirsch German version of Loch Lomond, and um, German fans only think of this tune as their one. They most of them probably don't even know the origin of it, and then Scottish fans, of course, hear it and think Loch Lomond, and. The reason why I, I picked this one out is that year in, year out, this gets selected by fans across Germany, no matter who you support, when they say which club has the best anthem, they all say Kern. So there's a little bit of Scotland in, in Kern, and most Scots don't know it. How did you feel when you had to leave your family to obviously come to the USA? Well, I'm trying to take myself back in time. I, it, I was excited to, to have the new challenge, but I was lonely. I remember the, the early days. I, I felt quite lonely um, to begin with. It was something I think I wanted to put myself through. Um, I was 24 at the time, but you know, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any contacts. Imagine doing that, going to a new country where you really don't know anybody. You're having to start from scratch. And um, in those days, we didn't have the internet. So it, it would be easier nowadays for somebody because you could get on you know, Zoom or, or Skype or something and, and talk to somebody if, if you're lonely. I didn't have that. Couldn't even really make phone calls because they were pretty expensive in, in those days. So I would write these letters and I've still got some of the letters uh, that I got back from my dad and my mother and my sister and some of my friends. And I'd spend an inordinate amount of time just handwriting letters. Um, 
And I'd be so excited when I saw that a letter had come from Scotland, you know, maybe several weeks later. And I, I would pour over every word and really sort of savour it. So it was a different time back then. And, um, you know, I think people who, who make long journeys like that and do it on their own, I think they probably all go through the, th the same thing. But maybe there's part of them that wants to do that to improve themselves, you know. And I think it has helped me. I think it's made me a better person. Um, having that experience, a more rounded person. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the experience, even though at the time, it certainly wasn't a picnic. You know, it was, um, uh, I didn't have much money. I was, uh, I was not uh, living extravagantly at all. I was definitely counting the pennies. And, um, but we got through it. And, and that was a, a learning experience for me. What was your ambition and why? Ooh, my ambition in life, I suppose I had, I suppose the ambition would always have been to be a commentator, even though I didn't necessarily think that that was a realistic ambition, you know. I think my more realistic ambition was to be a, a, an international translator, uh, a, an interpreter. I think I thought that's probably what would be more logical for me. I, I think I saw myself, maybe if I got lucky, working at somewhere like the, the European Union or the United Nations, uh, somewhere involving a headset. And, and, you know, I guess the headset is never far away from me in, in my professional work, or that's been the case since 1986. But um, I think I probably thought that that, that was, was likely what I would end up doing, or maybe a teacher, you know, maybe a, a teacher of, of German. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I got to do, as I said, the, the sort of the, the dream ambition, the one that you're not really entitled to think that you're going to get to do. But I put a lot of hard work into it. And the one thing, Darren, is I still put a lot of hard work into it. You know, people assume that once you get to a certain stage of your career and you've been doing it for years while well, you sort of coast. But not really. Um, the, the workload never ends. And that is part of the fun of it and, and part of the discipline of it, too. What was it like to obviously do the Bundesliga uh, to come into on the Bundesliga and do some MLS games? Well, I'll start with the Bundesliga because that is you know, really dear to my heart. Um, <clears throat> going back to my younger days in Aberdeen, listening to German radio and speaking fluent German, um, studying German at university, going to spend some time in Germany. You know, there's a kind of a common theme there. So it was really only later in life, probably around, you know, 2008, 2009, that I actually got to start broadcasting the Bundesliga regularly. Previously, I'd always been following it. I'd been watching it. I'd been listening to it. I would subscribe to my Kicker magazine, which is the, the Bible of German football every week. And, um, but these last sort of 10 years, especially when I was back working based in the UK for ESPN and for BT Sport, I got to do a lot more. In fact, it was sort of part of my job that I would do a Bundesliga game most weeks. And then in the years after that, the, the Bundesliga uh, itself in Germany um, expressed an interest in having me uh, be part of their team for their World Feed broadcasts. And, and I, of course, um, found this really you know, exciting and interesting and right up my street. And um, so that involved going to Germany a lot more to broadcast games. And when we left uh, the UK in 2017 to come back here to the USA, uh, it was very clear that I could continue going to Germany regularly to broadcast the Bundesliga. So it's a real, I would call that one a labor of love. Uh, it's something that I hope I can, I can do for as long as I'm broadcasting and as long as uh, I'm of sound mind and, uh, and have a voice to broadcast with. So, so that is, <clears throat> is very special. Um, MLS, different story there. I, I started with the very first year of MLS in 1996. I was the voice of the revolution, as they, as they called me, which is quite a what a kind of an evocative title, isn't it, to be the voice of the revolution, but it was the New England Revolution, uh, the team here in Boston, and I was their broadcaster for the first few years of their existence. Unfortunately, my memories are tinged with a bit of disappointment because they were not a very good team. Um, they tended to be just about the worst team in MLS in those early years, and if you're broadcasting every game, that gets quite hard and quite wearing, having to tell a, a sad story all the time, having to, um, and having sometimes to talk things up when you know, really, they probably didn't merit being talked up. So I did that. I did um, also broadcast games for the LA Galaxy, for the Columbus Crew, and for the, the team in uh, New York, New Jersey, the Metro Stars, uh, as they were called back then. And um, 
that was fun too. But I think I, I decided around 2000, 2001, that I wanted to focus much more on the international coverage of, of football with the Champions League, with La Liga, with Serie A, um, with the Bundesliga, obviously, with the, with, with the Champions League, as I mentioned, which was sort of the bread and butter. Um, and um, so I got away from MLS. I've dabbled in it a couple of times since, but it's not a regular thing for me. There are many people who, who broadcast MLS very well, week in, week out. It just hasn't been so much on, on my um, uh, calendar for quite some time. Would you like to do the Scottish Premiership again? Um, again, I love all these questions, and that's a great question. Um, I think it's one of these things that the heart would, of course, love to do the Scottish Premiership again. But the head kind of tells me certainly not for the foreseeable future. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, when I was back broadcasting Scottish football every week, and, and I came back uh, from the USA in 2009, and I was determined to put everything into Scottish football. So I really wanted it not to be half measures. I wanted to, you know, to, to show the passion that I have for it and make that come alive on the air. And, you know, hopefully I went part of the way towards succeeding with that. But when I left in 2017, you know, some people said to me, well, maybe you could come back and do the odd game here or there. And, and I said, no, I don't want to do that because I feel as though I've, I've done it. I've put everything into it. Um, if I came back and just dabbled in it a, little, a bit here, a bit there, I wouldn't be doing myself justice and I might not be doing Scottish football justice. And plus I thought it was fair to whoever my successor was, and it ended up being the excellent Rory Hamilton, um, to let them have the gig and not have somebody else kind of looking over their, their shoulder or taking games away from them that by rights really should be, be theirs. So, um, it's one of these things that um, I'm back here in the USA and obviously I do travel around and I go to Germany a lot. And I'm not saying that I would never say never if somebody approached me with a view to doing a, a particular game, um, but it would have to be the right circumstances. And it would, I would have to feel that I'm not taking it away from somebody else, um, that it's maybe a standalone kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you never say never. It's possible. Uh, I don't think it's likely in the short term, but we'll see. We'll see what the years ahead have in store for us. What was it? What is it like hearing yourself back? <laughs> it um it depends on your mood, I think. Uh, obviously, I, I've been listening to myself for a long time out of necessity because I realised early on at a young age the only way you improve as a broadcaster is by listening back. You know, is by being critical, and so you're listening back not to kind of say, oh, you know, listen to how great I sound. You're actually doing the opposite. You're kind of listening. Um, sort of through, you know, gritted teeth going, ah, why did I say that? Oh, I could have said that more smoothly. So it's all part of the, the learning process. Um, I will admit that, you know, now at this stage of my career, I've, I've probably listened to myself back less than I used to because, um, you know, uh, th th there is a limit <laughs> to how often you can do that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is part of the editing process, um, listening back to your, to, your, to your own work. I mean, some people I know just really can't. I, I know people we're very experienced broadcasters who can't even do it for, for a few minutes. They just say, no, I, I, I can't. And, and you know, I, I think it is true that most of us need to understand when we have to do it and, and when we, we don't have to do it. I do actually do it a lot more with the video game now than probably during a game. And the reason why I do that is, again, not because I can't get enough of listening to myself, but actually because I want to understand how the commentary is being used in the context of the game. And that only helps with regard to future editions. And I know the producers do that as well. So we listen, we make notes, and we sort of say, okay, this, maybe this is a bit too high, this is a bit too low, uh, maybe this phrase is being used a bit too often, maybe we can change that. So it's all just part of the, the sort of the quality control process. Now, in like the FIFA games, why do you not put all the SPL teams in? Well, that's not my decision. That kind of is, is above, above me. Um, I think the explanation would be it's a matter of um, which clubs uh, are under contract. You know, so I think they have to go and make a deal with every club to, to get the club in the game. And, and obviously, you know, I'm not privy to what negotiations are like on that front. But that, I think that's the short answer is that um, 
uh, not every club or every league has contracted to be at the game. So, like, back uh, at the start, you said that you did play football yeah. when you were younger. Did you enjoy it? I did. Oh, I loved it. I remember the early days at the playground. I absolutely adored it because, of course, I'd been watching the game on TV. I'd started to go to matches at the Tawdry, and I wanted to try to kind of, you know, emulate uh, players I, I'd seen on TV or at the ground. Um, I, I loved it. But I, I also had, I had a couple of things going against me as a young uh, person. One was I had very bad knees, and I still have um, these sort of knee troubles to this day. And that meant I was never going to be a great player. I was almost compensating and almost sort of feeling that I, I couldn't go all out because of the, the knee situation. I was also, and I don't think I've ever really told anybody this, um, I was also a, a violin player. And um, I was part of this little group that had been started in Aberdeen of, uh, of five-year-olds to begin with, uh, picking up the violin. It was this thing called the Suzuki Method. And the idea was that you really gave these young kids full immersion in the violin at a young age. And unfortunately, part of the deal with the violin was that if you played the violin, as, as I did as part of this little group, we were pretty much told we had to be part of this orchestra on a Saturday morning. And on a Saturday morning, of course, that's when a lot of the school's football is going on. So I was sort of ruled out of the, um, of the football scene and had to, to take on these, uh, these orchestral commitments. In retrospect, it probably did me a lot of good. Again, it's part of being a rounded person. You know, the fact that I'm not a very good violin player nowadays, I'm out of practice, but I can still do it, you know? And it maybe helped develop the, the musical ear a little bit. And I often think the musical ear goes uh, into having a, a style of broadcasting that is a bit musical as well. So um, all things happen for a reason, I think, you know, or at least a lot of things do. Why do I like work and with Lee Dixon on the FIFA game? Oh, Lee's a great guy. Um, he's, he's funny he, in a dry way, a dry kind of Mancunian way uh, from Manchester. And, uh, you know, we're different and that's why Sometimes you, you see that with, with partnerships. You've got one person who's a bit more straight and the other person who's maybe a bit more uh, humorous and you sort of dovetail that way. But no, he's a great guy. And, and I love hearing his stories about his playing days because he's got so many having you know, played at such a high level for Arsenal and for England for so long. And so uh, that's what we do. We just sit back and, and, uh, and take in all his stories about you know, whether it's his time playing under George Graham or... Arsene Wenger or uh, his teammates like Martin Keown and Tony Adams, people like that. So yeah, he, he's, he's a super guy and what you see is what you get with Lee. The, the, the same guy that you hear on, uh, on ITV or on FIFA with me, that's, that's Lee Dixon for you. Um, what's the best advice you've been given? The best advice I've been given, oh, I, these questions are, are knockout questions. Um, the best advice I've been given, I've, I've been given a lot of really good advice. Um, I think the best advice I've been given would be um, slow down. Don't try to rush the process. Don't always be in a hurry because like most young people, I think I was always in a hurry. I wanted to you know, go here, there, and everywhere. I wanted to, you know, move to, to the USA from BBC at 24, having been there for five years. You know, I, 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 I was a, a young person in a hurry. There's no doubt about that. And, and a wise owl said to me once, you know, just enjoy the journey a bit more, you know, smell the roses. Um, don't think that, uh, you know, you have to achieve everything at once. You know, it, 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 it'll come to you if you, you know, be dedicated, but don't necessarily think that you have to, to rush through every stage. And I see this a little bit during the pandemic, you know, I, I see um, a lot of people who just want to kind of, you know, they want to rush back to normal. And, you know, we would all love that, but sometimes we, we can't, you know, and sometimes we have to enjoy what we have and appreciate what we have and um, take each stage as it comes. And eventually all this will be a memory and it'll be something that we'll reflect on. And I think it's only with a little bit of time and wisdom that you can say that. And certainly when I was much younger, I would never have uh, realized that because I was too much in a hurry. So, yeah, that would be the best bit of advice I've ever been given. And I, I've tried to put it into practice. And what advice would you give my 
like fellow people that watch my channel, but also subscribers as well. Ooh, well, it's hard to, to give uh, sort of all-encompassing advice. Do you mean about uh, anything in particular? Or yeah, just... yeah, just anything. Um, well, I, I probably would say that. I probably would say, um, you know, don't be in a rush. Um, I, I would say enjoy life, you know, enjoy life, but realize that enjoying life is not necessarily just doing what you want all the time, you know. Um, enjoying life can actually be helping somebody else, you know, and... and I tried to, I've been, I've been trying, thinking about that during this pandemic as well. What can I do every day to help somebody? What can I do every day to be nice to somebody that, um, you know, otherwise wouldn't be considered, you know? And, and I think we can all do that. And I think if we all take that into our lives, and it, it, it's, it's when I was in the, um, in the Cub Scouts, you know, it was the, uh, the, the good deed every day, you know? Uh, and, and there is something to be said for that. And it sometimes doesn't have to take up too much of our time. It's sometimes just thinking about somebody, you know, that there'll be somebody in your life. Uh, and I'm talking to everybody here. There'll be somebody in your life who um, just even by hearing from you, it would make their day, you know? And um, I think that's one of the things we can take out of this pandemic is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've been a bit selfish for a long time, you know, all of us, I, I don't, you know, not talking about one person, but just all of us, we, we've, We've lived in this very selfish world and, you know, this is an opportunity of a lockdown is frustrating for people. It's an opportunity to take stock of that. And um, yeah, I try to do that every day. Just, just be nice to somebody. Uh, and, and if we do that every day, then um, I think we're on the right path. So what I'll do one thing that here, I'll carry on chatting to you. If that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, so thank you very much, uh, Derek Gray, for taking your time out to chat with me. Darren, thank you very much. All the best to you. Good luck to your YouTube channel as well. I hope people who've enjoyed this interview will subscribe to it. And keep in touch, my friend. Thank you.